we are coming close to the end of this book of First Timothy. So you can congratulate yourself for plowing through together for the past six chapters. But next week, we have one last sermon uh, Elder Gregory will cover for us. So let me do a quick recap what we have gone through in chapter 6, verse 1 to 10. So he was talking about a teaching, false teaching that leads us to be greedy and not godly. Uh, it was preached by Pastor Vincent last week. And uh, there will always be false teachers around. And false teachers are actually very hard to identify. You know, they are called pastors, they are called lecturers, they are called leaders and found in the church. You know, and they, are all, they always call themselves, and we would call them too, the servants of God, or ministers of the gospel. You know, and who is the real one? And who is the fake one? So it's actually quite difficult for the church to identify. You know, and they always appear in churches, and they do church works, mission works even. Recently, I met up with a brother from another church. He was just sharing with me that in this church, there was this missionary who came back and, uh, and reside in his church and from his church, reside back in his church and for the past 10 years, have been helping herself with the church offering. And she was tasked to count the church offering before the COVID period. Like, she would have to physically count the offering collected. And for the past 10 years, she has helped herself to at least 1 million of the uh, money. So it's hard. They always appear in church. They may do church work, mission works. But a lot of these servants of God attracts thousands of followers. You know, and many times they are actually feeding their own pockets, feeding their own ego. You know, and we, we haven't heard of pastors embezzling funds of the church, twisting the word of God to mislead people. So, the question we ask is, how do we know who are the true servants of God? They don't walk around with a tag here and say, ah, I'm a servant of God and true, this is a fake one. Or, or, they don't. You know, that's as hard as a scammer to identify them. So my sermon title today, therefore, is Can the Real Servant of God Please Stand Up? Okay, before we dive into the passage today, we will pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is eternal truth for us. So we pray that God, as we open up your word this afternoon in 1 Timothy 6, you open our eyes to see wondrous truth. But your Holy Spirit was so graciously also operates in our hearts, opening our hearts to embrace this truth into my heart and to the hearts of all of us here as hearers to be convictions for our life. But we do not just pray for ourselves. We also want to pray for the Chinese fellowship that's happening now that Pastor Vincent is preaching to them and teaching them. We pray that God, you do that wonderful work in their lives as well through Pastor, Preacher, Pastor Vincent. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, can the real servant of God please stand up? Okay, verse 11, my first division. Okay, um, the quality of a real servant of God. Okay, so you, you take a look at verse 11 here. Uh, there's a term that Paul uses on Timothy, and he says, you man of God. You know, this is a term that has been used many times, 20 to 30 times in the Old Testament. So when Paul uses this, this term, it quickly recalls in the mind of all the readers you know, that Paul was referring to someone, something in the Old, Old Testament. Let me just give you some example. The man of God has been used in Deuteronomy to refer to Moses. Used in 1st, 2nd Kings for Elijah. If you ever heard about Elijah, the, the great prophet who slain 450 uh, Baal's prophets. You know, and, and his protege, uh, Elisha. So all these, these have been used on them and all these prophets, named and unnamed prophets of the Old Testament. So when Paul uses this on Timothy, he says, you, man of God, he's referring to someone or, or a true servant of God, or true God's people, you know, who faithfully and fearlessly bring God's word to challenge Israel at a time, to, bring, to confront the sin of Israel in the Old Testament and, and the surrounding nations as well. So this is the same term now applies not just to Timothy as the pastor of the Ephesus church, 
But of course, to him and his leaders, and subsequently also it applies to the members of the church, that the men of God or the people of God, that's what we are supposed to do. You know, and what is the quality? What is the quality of a true servant of God? We ask ourselves. Well, the first thing we see here, he has to do something. He has to flee from something. And you see, the first command there is to flee. Flee these things. What are these things? Well, the things that have been preached to us last Sunday, the things that you have to flee in like, for example, verse 5, flee from thinking that godliness is a means to gain. Thinking that using religion, using the faith, using the church, using ministry to bring money to their own pocket. You know, the thinking and godliness is a means to gain all flee from, like verse 10 says, the love of money, which is the root of all evil, and plunge them into all the terrible things. You know, so it's to flee from these things to not seek their personal gain, you know, but to really pursue something on, on the other hand. Look, uh, verse 11 says, contrasting to flee from something, he has to pursue something. And what is he supposed to pursue? There are six qualities there. I'm just going to give you a quick definition of these six qualities that he's supposed to uh, pursue. Righteousness, meeting God's standard, not the world's standard or the world's KPI. No, it's God's standard. Uh, the next word is godliness, is to be God-centered, to be so bothered about what God thinks of us and not so much about what uh, think of us, or not just us, our, how we go about doing ministry, you know, not just how men think of us, or to do a man pleasing ministry, you know, and, or to do something that you will tweak the gospel to please people. No, you know, it's God centeredness. Faith, faith, or the word will be better translated as faithfulness, you know, which is to not to distort God's word, but to keep God's word that it is, preach it as it is, you know, not for gain or to avoid confrontation just because you are so afraid to offend people, but to be faithful to the task that's entrusted to him. Love, which is, I put it, other people-centered, not for their self-love, gaining money for themselves, no, but to love God and to love the people of God. And steadfastness, which is to endure or patiently wait. Well, this is a quality that is lacking in today's uh, culture because we want things fast everything is fast we want a, a cup of a noodle it must be done within three minutes you know everything must be fast but doing god's ministry the, and a lot of time the gospel growth in the person's life and take the fruition to come to know faith and grow to be christ-like takes a long long time so people want the shortcut but one quality of the true servant of god is to be patient to see that growth we will last a lifetime rather than the quick three minute uh, fervor and after that fizzled off easily. No, this, this is a quality that is needed of a true servant of God. And lastly, gentleness and words or our attitudes. Because sometimes people may understand truth, come to understand some convictions slower. So, a servant of God ought to be patient with such individual and gentle with them. So, in summary, what is a true quality of the servant of God, a true man of God or woman of God? The true quality of a true servant or quality of a true servant is godly character. But that, if you have been sit through this book of First Timothy, you will hear this over and over again, right? Since chapter one, you talk about having a good conscience. Chapter two, talk about the, the standard for true men praying with hand uh, lifted up without dissension, to a true woman continuing faith, love, uh, holiness, and propriety in chapter 2. Then chapter 3, talk about the qualities of the elders and the deacons, that they must be above reproach. It's all about character. Chapter 4, that Timothy is supposed to be exemplary in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Remember chapter 4, talk about that. And uh, chapter 5, the last chapter, we talk about the true widow and disciplining of the elders who sin because of character flaws. You know, character, why is there a repetition throughout this whole book of First Timothy about character? Well, I would think of one key reason because the church is so easily influenced by the world. The church always allows the world to mold us into its shape. You know, 
that we may start to think that external qualities instead of godly character is more important. You know, what kind of leaders we look for? The church has the tendency to look for good looking guy, maybe woman or smart person, well educated, capable of doing many things, eloquent. Maybe even we pick people who are to serve because they are helpful and always available. You know, instead of looking for godly character, and the church must be run by people who love God and love God's people. You know, and, and I not every now and then I still get people talk asking me, say, hey, what well, this person can sing, what well, let him sing. This person can lead, let him lead. This person can preach, let him preach. This person can teach, let him teach. You know, they, they always come to me, but we don't just look for abilities. The more important question is this. You know, is there consistency in growing in godly character? We are not looking for a perfect person, please. We are looking for consistency in growing in godly character. The person is growing. You know, so that's how we choose the servants of God, the men of God, the women of God to serve. Not because of their ability, their eloquence, but because we see in them this growing Christ-likeness, godly character. This is what Timothy is telling him. Oh, it's wrong. Paul is telling Timothy that you men of God this is what you ought to pursue, you know, what you chase after. You know, but besides godly character, there's something else is needed of a good servant or the true servant of God. Verse 12, I put my division here. I put it as uh, the task of a true servant of God. So verse 12 says, he must fight the good fight. And the word fight here is where our English word come from, agonize. You know, and the, the agonize or striving, earnestly laboring over something. So what was Timothy supposed to earnestly labor for? Well, he say, fight the good fight of the faith. Fight the good fight of the faith is an objective truth. The gospel, the word of God itself. This is his task. The gospel, that verse 12 tells us the gospel that gives us eternal life is not a theory that we are fighting for or some dead traditions that we are fighting for. Paul says this gives eternal life. This gives eternal life. The gospel gives life to people. It's worth fighting for. And this is what Timothy himself confessed or professed before many weaknesses. So I put here, you know, so a, a, a true servant of God labor intensely to understand, to teach, and defend the gospel truth. To understand, it really means that we need to put in our BTS. I mean, not the Korean uh, uh, pop group, but BTS, our blood, tears, and sweat to study the word of God in its historical context, to read a passage like what we are doing in uh, Timothy, passage by passage in 1 Timothy, to read in this uh, literary context here, you know, the context of the passage. And unlike verse 4, you take a look at chapter 6, verse 4, unlike the four teachers, they, they, Paul says they, they understand nothing, you know, but we ought to understand the word of God carefully and not just understanding it, but to teach it as well. Teach it carefully to pass on the gospel from generation to generation, you know, and not to impress people by our teaching, not to attract attention to ourselves or to gain fame. No, that's what the false teacher does. Look at verse 4 again. He says, unlike the false teachers who are puffed up, who are conceited, who want to impress people, you know, they want, they, they, they use controversies to attract attention or fame to themselves. Can you see that verse 4 says that they actually think that godliness is a it's a means to gain. You know, lastly, not just to understand, to teach, but to defend it faithfully, faithfully and fearlessly like the prophets of the old, like Elijah, like Elisha of the Old Testament who preached the hard truth to Israel even it endangers their life. And they speak up against false teaching. So the true servant of God refers not just to Timothy, but to Timothy's leaders, the elders, the deacons, but also finally the whole church as a whole is to take this task very seriously. Why? You may ask. 
why do we take this task so seriously? Why did Paul give this such a serious command? Well, Paul always give Timothy a command and then this serious command and then give him a reason behind this. You know, verse 16 to 13 to 16. The focus of the true servant for God. This portion is so crucial. 13 to 16, sorry, the verse must change. 13 to 16. <coughs> Okay, and this, this portion here, the portion here that I'm preaching here from 11 to 16, right? It acts like a beef patty. Before the passage, before this, it's like the, it's a top bread. And bottom is like a top bread. It's a bottom bread, sorry. The, before that, it's talk about money. Then the bottom bread, talk about money, which is uh, Elder Greg will talk about it. And he's more suitable. Like, he gets the riches here. So, uh, just kidding. <laughs> so, you have the top bread, talk about money. The bottom talk about money, and now this portion here is a beef patty. Is, is telling you why the very important reason, you know, which is this portion here, the focus of the true servant of God is not money, the top of the bubble. The true focus of the servant of God is this, you know. And Paul charged it to Timothy, and a very serious charge. Verse fourteen says he has to do this in do in in these two. Uh, uh, in these two ways, without stain, that means he must pursue these things, obey this commandment, and not to be stained by greed, unlike the false teachers. And at the same time, without reproach, to make sure that his character is not faulted. In these two ways, it's a very serious charge uh, for uh, Timothy in verse uh, 15. So, why? Verse 14, sorry. Why is this so? Because the charge, you look at it closely at verse 13, is before God. Can you see that in verse 13? It says, I, I charge you before God and before Christ. So there are two things that is happening here. The focus of a true servant is about God himself. In what ways? Number one, focusing on God who gives lives. It could mean that like generally give us life, but it could also mean that God will give us eternal life, or both. You know, God who give us life, therefore we owe Him our whole life. But when we fall away from Him in sin, He save us by giving us eternal life through Jesus Christ again. So we owe God our life two times. First by creation, second by redemption. So it is only logical that we should serve God as a true servant of God. It should be and that's a key reason why we are serving. It's God focus. Second reason, it says, in the presence of Christ, who make a good confession before Pontius Pilate. And I think Jenna Elder already explained why Pontius Pilate when he quoted uh, uh, John chapter 18. You know, because before Pontius Pilate, whatever confession Jesus gave, if he make the true confession, it's going to cause him suffering and death, which he did. And Jesus did not string back. He fearlessly said, "Remember that." And when he make that confession, instead of saying, "Oh no, I did get the wrong person. Yeah, it's not actually not me. You know, it's someone else." He could do that. Then he string back. But Jesus did not string back. Why? Because for the sake of to save sinners, he made that profession. He made a confession before Pontius Pilate. So Timothy, when he's afraid, when he's faced with opposition as a servant of God, he's supposed to look at Christ and realize that Christ did not string back to save sinners. So he, in the face of opposition, he's supposed to focus on God and Christ and not string back as well. So the focus of a true servant of God is God. You know, so... Sometimes when we are afraid to make a gospel confession, to point out sin in people's life or our own life, when we are afraid to offend people, we really have to ask ourselves, who are we serving? Who is the focus of our ministry, our service, our gospel? You know, is it to please men or to please God? So a true servant of God, his focus is on God. Not just that. His focus is not just on God, but his focus is also on the ultimate reality. And you take a look at the verse, verse 14, Paul began to mention to Timothy about the second coming of Christ 
And this time, we're going to meet Christ at the great day of His coming. But who are we not going to meet? We are not going to meet a weak, helpless baby that came 2,000 years ago. No. We're going to meet, over here the verse says, the blessed sovereign, the king of kings, the Lord of Lords, he's going to come in the presence of God and the presence of all his holy angels. The whole world will be awakened at this glorious sight. Christian, non-Christians throughout the whole globe, dead or alive, will bring up to life those who are dead, will meet him at this glorious, glorious day. And Paul says, these days is the ultimate reality. You know, the ultimate reality is to, this, is to understand this is that this world belongs to God and He's going to take it back. This is our ultimate reality. Not the politicians of this world who determines the education system, the, 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 the political system of this world, not the, the person who built this financial system of this world. Because Singaporeans are just scared. We, we're scared that we, we will lose out in our education system, we will lose out in our financial system, we, lose, we will not be able to achieve some goal in our CPF when we retire. We, we are scared of a lot of things. But these are not the ultimate reality. We are, these are not our reality. The ultimate reality doesn't belong to the rich and the powerful. The pretty and the, the smart don't have the last say. I'm sorry for those who are smart and pretty and rich, like Elder Gregory. You know, he, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> he, he doesn't have a last say. <laughs> we don't have a last say. None of us. The sovereign Lord, the King of Kings, have the last say. This, this is ultimate reality. This is God's will. He's going to take it back. You know, and Timothy, as a true servant of God, must understand he's serving this ultimate reality, serving God and his kingdom, you know. And this God himself possesses immortality. You know, he decides how the time will end and how is it going to be like. He decides the end story of this whole creation and he's going to rule eternally. Verse 16 tells us he's going to have an eternal dominion. That is the ultimate reality. Not your teachers in your school, that sometimes students are so afraid to, uh, to offend the teachers, lecturers, the boss, their friends, opinions. You know, they're so afraid to offend people because we are more man pleaser than God pleaser. Because we don't, you have not seen into us yet. What's the ultimate reality? You know, the ultimate reality is this is God's will. He is going to take it back and He's going to rule forever. And if a true servant of God is really aware of this ultimate reality, what is it going to be like? Well, he's going to, you will see the, from the way what he works for and he, how he works at it. You know, he's not going to work just merely for money, slotting his whole life out just for money, like the false teachers in the previous passage. He, this is not what he's going to, just going to work for. Neither is the way he's going to work for it. You know, he's not going to twist God's word for fame or for gain. No. A true servant of God will not be treating health and wealth as the ultimate goal of his life. The true servant of God, the man of God and the woman of God will treat health and wealth as a means to the ultimate goal. And what's the ultimate goal? Verse 16 tells us, his ultimate goal is for the glory of God. And this God, to Him be glory and dominion forever. His ultimate goal is to honor this King. Honor this King by having a godly character and keeping and preaching and defending the gospel. When health and money and wealth are the means to this goal, but they are never the goal in itself. If we have the money and if we have the health, we will serve this ultimate purpose, which is for the glory of God, and not the other way around. So let me summarize this passage for us quickly. It's not the shortest summary I can think of. So <laughs> not 10 words summary anymore. So Paul commanded Timothy to be the true servant of God or the man of God in pursuing a godly character and working hard, earnestly, 
for the gospel because this is the ultimate reality while focusing on God and the coming kingdom. Christians, believers, do you know that you are the men and the woman of God in this generation and for this generation? In a perverse generation where greed and financial security is our focus, is a focus of this generation. In fact, not just our generation, in Timothy's generation, 2,000 years ago, rather than godliness and the proclamation of the gospel that gives life, this generation needs the true servant of God. They need the man of God and the woman of God. And will you be one? Would I be one? Man of God, woman of God who focus on godly characters, not just pursuing degrees to have, have a high paid job and finally get the security and money and all these. No, not, these are not wrong in itself, but this is not the ultimate goal, but this is the bridge to the goal. Men of God who labor to understand and to communicate God's truth to a dying world, to die without the gospel. Men of God who focus on God and Christ Jesus and not afraid of man's opinion. And the men and women of God who are fully aware of the ultimate reality, which is, this is God's world. He's going to take it back and rule forever. So, some simple application for men and women of God. Flee, first thing. What to flee? Flee greed. Abstain from any lure for love of money. It, it, it depends on who you are, depends on what state of, of your life you are, and depends on your lure. What, what lures you more? You know, maybe some, to some people, 20 cents lures them. To some people, it's 20 million. It depends. So it could be as simple as if you know some gambling thing, 4D buying, you know this is going to lure you, then abstain, flee from these things. Maybe some people, it's as easy as a lucky draw, or it's as easy as some quick money from some investment to, to make. Maybe these are things that will just pull their attention to, to love money, then escape from them. Flee from these things. Flee. Second command here is to pursue. Pursue godly character. But then again, it depends on who, who you are, what, are, what kind of struggles you have. You know, if you are tendency to be harsh and not gentle, then maybe work on it. And when you have express your harsh tones to your spouse, your parents, your kids, to your friends or siblings, then learn to say, learn to repent, come back to them and say, I'm sorry for my tone, I'm sorry for my words I use. Then as you learn this more, do this more and more, working on your character, you know, then you are pursuing, pursuing something. Or if you are, it could be the area of steadfastness, you know, you are impatient for results. You, you want someone to come to know Christ or you want uh, to have some growth in the person and you are so impatient, you know, so you, you begin to rush ahead of God's time, use your own method into your God's method, then you need to learn to be patient and pray and pray that God will teach you His timing. Yeah. And third thing, fight. Fight the good fight of the faith. You know, so take time to know the word of God, know the gospel in the word of God, and start sharing with people. So one simple exercise for us to do this December, the next year we're going to preach through the book of Deuteronomy. So my challenge to all of us here is to read the book of Deuteronomy every day, four chapters, three to four chapters. You will cover the whole book of Deuteronomy in, within uh, December two times, if you do that. You know, I've, I've, I'm, I'm already doing it. I'm finishing my Deuteronomy already as, 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 as a second or third round. So is, do that in Deuteronomy and then share with someone. Share the word of God with someone. You know, what you learn from Deuteronomy as you read through and all this. As you read through more and more, you begin to see the big picture of Deuteronomy before we go into the specific passages. So take the time. Take the time to fight the good fight of faithful. Agonize. The word is agonize to, to, to earnestly, uh, fervently, be involved in, in doing it, you know, so and share with someone. And lastly, 
remember the you are ultimate reality you know when you are pressurized by education system when you are pressurized by money the financial system and when you're pressurized even to take up a certain job like a high pay uh, or, or something but actually it will compromise your work with god it will compromise your time with your church family or compromise your time with your family you know always remember the ultimate reality that this is god's will he is going to take it back and he will rule forever not the financial system not the best investment and not even the best school that you can go to so the last reflection for all of us as christians as believers do you know that you are the men of god that this generation need the women of god that this generation need i'm going to give us 30 seconds to think through and i'm going to close in prayer Let's pray. You, O oh Lord, has been so gracious to save us at such a high cost, at the cost of your own son, to purchase us to be your servants. Teach us, help us by your Holy Spirit to be good servant, men and women of God in our generation. For your glory's sake. Amen.